Thank you, Leo, very much, and welcome to everyone wherever you're joining us uh, from. So the title for our discussion today is Europe's Recovery Fund, a step towards the completion of economic and monetary union, or yet another lost opportunity reinforcing the Eurozone's fragmentation. I'd like to thank uh, the German Society and the Hellenic Society of the LSE Students' Union for inviting me to chair this uh, discussion, and particularly that because we have uh, such uh, a well-known and expert uh, speaker on this uh, topic. Yanis Varoufakis, of course, uh, was Minister of Finance uh, for Greece in 2015, uh, perhaps one of the most famous finance ministers in Europe of, the, of recent decades. He's now a leader and founder of a left-wing party in the Greek parliament, Mira Ikosipenda. Uh, so he's a current member of parliament, but he has taught economics in a number of countries, uh, including the UK, Australia, and the United States. So Professor uh, Radafakis most recently taught at the University of Texas in Austin. Uh, as Leo has said, you can send me your questions using the facility at the bottom of the Zoom screen. Our format is that this event will last for about 60 minutes. In a moment, I'm going to pass over to Yanis Varoufakis to uh, give a short introduction of about 10 minutes. I'll follow up with some questions and then uh, I'll pick up uh, the questions you send us so that we can have a good, lively uh, discussion. So, uh, on behalf of uh, not only myself, but the two societies, a very warm welcome, uh, Yanis Varoufakis. Kevin, thank you so much. It is my turn to thank uh, both societies for getting together. Um, it is heartwarming to have Greek and uh, German, German and Greek, uh, no priorities here, students coming together in order to interrogate our Europe because this was never meant to be a clash between the Germans and the Greeks, the North and the South. Um, maybe it was on behalf of um, enemies of Europe meant to be that. We are here as Europeanists, at least I'm here as a Europeanist, and I know Kevin is here as a Europeanist, and I'm sure that most of you are. Uh, allow me to speak directly to the topic. Is the recovery fund, EU, next generation, whatever, you know, <laughs> Brussels has called it, is it um, a step towards federation, towards fiscal unity, towards political union? Or is it, um, as Kevin said, um, another lost opportunity, perhaps uh, another uh, step towards fragmentation and disintegration? Now, allow me to take you a few decades back, because uh, this question um, has exercised minds greater than mine. Um, right from the beginning of the trials and tribulations of the European Union, which, in my estimation, begin in August 1971. <laughs> now, why August 1971? Because you will recall that on the 15th of August uh, of 1971, President Richard Nixon uh, effectively announced your exit, the exit of Europe from the dollar zone, the end of Bretton Woods. The whole edifice of the European Union, at least from an economic perspective. Remember the first name of um, the European Union was the European Communities of Coal and Steel. Uh, it was um, a cartel to begin with. Not, I'm, I'm not give, trying to connote anything by that, I'm just describing. It was an attempt to bind together the heavy industries of North Europe, going all the way to North Italy, uh, in order to deny Europeans the instruments of conducting warfare, if you remember the famous expression. Uh, but in order to have that kind of cartelization of heavy industry, you needed a common currency. You couldn't allow free-floating exchange rates to go up and down, because it's very, very difficult to have a community of coal, steel, then later electrical goods, automakers, farmers coming in with uh, the, the Treaty of Rome and so on. That was working all swimmingly up, up until August 1971, uh, because we had a common currency, we had fixed exchange rates. We didn't have the same money, but the exchange rates were locked, and they were, they were locked as part of uh, American design, the Bretton Woods system. But the Americans at some point realized that they could not sustain this, let's not get into why, and they threw us out. 
And suddenly, all hell was breaking loose. <laughs> um, fluctuations of the Deutsche Mark vis-a-vis -vis the French franc were putting a, a, a huge amount of pressure on the whole edifice of the European Union at the time. Back then, uh, in fact, quite a few months in April, not in August, in April, a few months before the Eurex at the moment, um, a Cambridge economist, Nicholas Calder, published an article in the New Statesman. The article warned Europeans uh, from a Europeanist perspective not to think that by binding together their economies monetarily, by creating a common currency effectively, not to think that that would be the first step towards political union. Calder was very explicit and very prescient in his um, uh, article, and he said, folks, if you do that, after a while, a huge financial crisis is going to hit, hit the common currency area, and then politics will be poisoned and the political union will, will become impossible. So don't think that it's a first step towards political union. Okay, cut, 1991. Let's go, you know, 20 years later. In Brussels, in a room where you have the president of France, François Mitterrand, you have Jacques Delors, his former finance minister, and of course, in 1991, the most significant president of the European Commission, and um, actually a friend of mine who happened to be there, working with, as an aide to, uh, to Jacques Delors. Jacques Delors, so I have a, 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 you know, an eyewitness to this meeting. Delors was trying to convince Mitterrand of something similar to what Nicolas Calder was saying, saying in his New Statesman article. He tried to convince Mitterrand that, look, we are creating a giant with one leg, the European Central Bank. You know, a central bank without a state to have its back, to support many different states, but without the capacity to help them during a banking crisis, a financial crisis, to deal with sequential collapses of their banking sectors. And that is a disaster in the making. And that would be politically very brutal. And Jacques Delors was asking François to accept that the monetary union should be accompanied by a second pillar, a second leg for the giant, that should be an investment arm, or a leg, I should say, <laughs> to be more precise. Uh, and um, according to my friend who happened to be in the room, François Mitterrand thought about it. She looked up towards the ceiling for quite a few minutes, which must be very nerve wracking, and turned around to Jacques Delors and said, listen, Helmut and I, he meant Helmut Kohl, his partner in creating the Eurozone, um, would very much like that, but we don't have the political power to accomplish it. So we are going to do what we can, which is bring together um, our countries by means of a monetary union. And when the crisis you are warning us about comes, in other words, he had no illusions that the crisis would come, that would be huge, then our um, successors will have to do that, which we, cannot, we don't have the political power to do now. So here you have two theories. I mean, both Nicolas Calder and François Mitterrand agree that the Eurozone was not fit for purpose. The Eurozone architecture was a disaster in the making. It was going to create a crisis that would be gigantic and existential. Nicolas Calder, however, predicted that that would set in motion a train of political events that would eventually make the political federation, the political union, impossible. François Mitterrand, on the other hand, believed that it would make it inevitable. So who was right? Well, that's a big question, isn't it? And I think that is the question that we are, uh, we are exploring today. If you look at the last 10 years, Nicolas Calder has a head start. It's abundantly clear that we, we had a comedy of errors. The Greek bailout was a crime against logic. Um, I would also say against uh, millions of uh, people, not all of them Greek. Hmm. Um, a lot of German taxpayers, especially the poorer ones, suffered as a result of the inane handling of the euro crisis. Uh, but with COVID-19, um, the reaction 10 years later of our great and good leaders, particularly Emmanuel Macron and uh, Angela Merkel, remember Emmanuel Macron went back immediately in March when the you know, COVID-19 enhancement and the reinforcement of the crisis began to show, uh, he went back to the original Jacques Delors 
proposal to François Mitterrand of a Eurobond. Uh, 13 uh, member, member um, prime ministers and presidents, including the Greek prime minister, who was mocking me when I was supposed supporting a euro, a euro bond, you know, five, six years ago, thankfully embraced it too. Uh, Merkel again said no, uh, and instead created the, um, uh, the fund, the recovery fund. So the question now is, is this recovery fund um, a sign that uh, Europe has learned its lesson, that Berlin has uh, accepted uh, the French posi position? Or was Nicolas Calder always right? That once you create the, the Eurozone, the politics will become so toxic that not even a politician with the talent of Angela Merkel can um, detoxify the politics. There are arguments on both sides. And I'm happy with Kevin to discuss the arguments of those who say that uh, the recovery fund is indeed a, a move in the right direction, maybe not as fast as we would like to. And there are other arguments closer to Nicolas Calder's original prediction that it is not that Europe is moving too slowly in the right direction, it is moving fast in the wrong direction. And you will not be surprised to find out that I am of the latter opinion. Kevin. Thank you, Yanni, very much indeed. Uh, it sets things uh, very clearly in context. You've argued that um, this is a logic which uh, has two possible uh, outcomes. I wonder, um, when you say that the recovery fund may be inadequate, when you say that the um, innovation may not be uh, sufficient, are you implying a support for a, a much stronger fiscal union and indeed a parallel political union, completing what Mitterrand said that he couldn't deliver? Uh, and what would this EU look like? Uh, just one small correction and I'll answer your, your, your question. I'm not arguing that it is inadequate. I'm arguing that it is moving in the wrong direction. It's not that it is too little in the right direction, it's too much in the wrong direction. Um, I will be arguing that, I haven't explained it, I just flagged it. But let me come to the gist of your question. Uh, because you know, any such conversation has to have some kind of axiomatic framework, otherwise you know, we will uh, be all over the place. So my axiomatic framework, which are not really axioms, but I want to present them as axioms for the purposes of our discussion today, if you want to interrogate those axioms and turn them into theorems, we can. Uh, but my axiom is that the European Union needs to move into, to, move, to morph into a federal republic. That, um, you know, once you create a common currency, um, then you have to create uh, a political union. And because a fiscal union without a federal democracy is dictatorship. You know, people who have been calling for uh, even like Macron has been calling for a federal finance minister. I mean, that's absurd. You cannot have a federal finance minister unless the federal finance minister has a federal parliament. And the federal parliament has the capacity, you know, to hire and fire the federal uh, finance minister, uh, along with the, you know, the minister for innovation, the minister for labor, the minister for the environment, the minister for foreign affairs. So in other words, either we move in the direction of federation or the whole thing is going to buckle. Um, uh, Europe is very rich and we have the capacity to keep wasting our economic energy uh, while delaying the federation. So that's my axiomatic framework. But my point is that against many articles that I've read by people that I respect very highly since last June, this recovery fund is not the right uh, path towards federation. It is taking us further away from federation. My criticism is not that it is not taking us to federation fast enough, but it is undermining dynamite, its dynamite in the path of, towards federation. I'm a federalist, I declare it clearly. Could you explain then a little bit more, uh, Yanni, as to why it's the wrong direction? Uh, the, in one word, the one word that, that is the key to unlocking that, is automated. That is, uh, 
a process that brings us together has to be automated. You cannot leave it to the politicians. Let me give you an example, let, give our audience an example, Kevin, I'm sure you know that. Um, now, take the United Kingdom, since you're, that's where you are. Um, I could have taken any other example, but you happen to be in London, so there you are. Um, okay, now, when the 2008 hit, or 2020, COVID-19 hit, some areas, some regions in the United Kingdom suffered more than others. Uh, unemployment rose faster in Yorkshire compared to Sussex, right? Uh, usually, usually, but not always, uh, the greater need for fiscal transfers arises in the poorer regions. Not always, but usually. Now, the beauty of a federal system, a, you know, a fiscal union, a political union, is that the transfers are automated. That no one has to sit around the table and decide, I'm going to take so much money from jail to give it to Jack. Imagine the disaster that it would have been for the United Kingdom if um, when the pandemic hit, the United Kingdom had to do that which happens in Brussels with the European Union Council. That is, imagine if a representative from the northeast of England, a representative of the southeast of England, a representative from North Wales, from South Wales, from Scotland, yeah, they had to sit around the table and negotiate, right, how to affect a fiscal transfer. It would be poison. You know, it would be they, 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 all sorts of moralizing fingers would be pointed at people. Yeah. And imagine the, 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 you know, the madness of trying to work out a year or two years or three years in advance what the cost would be to decide to Newcastle of the pandemic and trying to agree in advance how much money will be taken from Sussex and Surrey and Devon to be given to Yorkshire. Now, it would, be, it would be madness to do it. It would yes. destroy the United Kingdom. Yeah. It would create centrifugal forces that throws everybody around. I can, Whereas, I can, I can see that. Sorry, just forgive me. I, I can see that. But in each of our national member states, to some extent, there are discretionary decisions uh, made. Um, the automaticity of transfers from one region to another is not set over the long uh, term. You're right, of course, that if we have unemployment benefit, then there is an automatic payment in any part of the, uh, the system. But we also have, uh, in each of our member states, decisions as to uh, infrastructure investment in sure, one of part of the uh, um, system or another. And I guess one of the arguments that is being made for the Recovery and Resilience Fund, incidentally, the second title is Resilience uh, Fund. Uh, yeah, they love this, this word, they love this word. <laughs> one of the, I, perhaps you may disagree with the resilience. Um, one of the arguments being made is that it doesn't actually require the same political buy-in to a burden sharing arrangements because it is the EU institutions and the Commission uh, borrowing on the financial uh, markets and then allocating funds which would otherwise not be there uh, to individual uh, member states. So okay, let's, let's, let's unpack this for, for, for the benefit of our audience before we see whether we agree or disagree. Uh, okay, firstly, the discretionary part of the automatic, you know, the comparison between the amount of money Take the United States, okay? Uh, the automatic stabilizers uh, are immediate. Now, you, you know, Kevin, that makes a difference because when they, they, that immediacy reduces the total amount of the fiscal transfer that is necessary. Because think about it. I mean, the, the recovery fund has not been, even been activated yet. Mm. It's not going to be activated until the summer. So nobody has got a penny yet. So, you know, this delay, it's like, it's like the medical pandemic. If, if, if you are too slow of the blocks to respond to the economic pandemic, uh, then you need a lot more. I mean, you, your cost is much greater. So the fact that, you know, by not having the automatic part of the stabilizing force, uh, in the end, the total amount of discretionary spending that needs to be done is much greater. It is not done because it's already been agreed back in June what it's going to be. So you can see the failure there. 
Uh, but if you look at Germany, for instance, because I, I've, I've done some back of envelope calculations, the discretionary part is 11%. 11%, 80, 89% is automatic stabilizers. Hmm. Right, so it's you know, so that part is the eighty-nine percent is missing from the eurozone, from the European Union. Now let's go to the second part, uh, and now I'm going to you know give the other side of the argument its best shot. So I'm, I'm uh, imagine now that I am speaking on behalf of Brussels, as you were, in a minute, a minute before, to, in favour of what is happening. Um, if I if we had a representative from Brussels here. Or from Berlin or from Paris, they would say, "Come on, Yanis, you know you're again you're painting a picture of gloom and doom. Um, you know, allow yourself to celebrate a major transformation of the European Union. Mm -hmm. This is the very first time we agreed to joint borrowing. The first time. I mean, we've had joint borrowing before, in the form of the EFSF, the European Financial Stability Fund. You know." The, the Greek bailouts, the, the it, 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 Irish bailouts, but that was not re really joined. It was synthetic. Uh, and I'm, I'm saying this, Kevin, for the benefit of our, of our students and, and, and of our audience, uh, because it's important to know that. Mm -hmm. uh, there was already, a, the, the SM had a, a, a capacity to, to borrow up to 500 billion. So it's not the first time that Europe is borrowing, yes. but it is the, it's the first time that one euro does not correspond to one country. Because if you look at the bonds that were issued back in 2010 to bail out Greece, uh, then later Ireland, and then you have the FSF, and then the ESM, each one of those bonds is fragmented. It's like a CDO, it, it has compartments. So when 100 euros was borrowed on behalf of Ireland, you know, 27 was borrowed by the Germans, by the German government, not the Germans, but the German government, 21 by the, the French government, 19 by the Italian government, and so on, in proportion to GDP. Okay, and each one of these fragments had its own interest rate, re representing the credit worthiness of the government. So it was like a CDO, it was not a common bond. That's why it was never a euro bond. So it is true that we're talking about a major shift, at least at the conceptual level, because this time, the money that the European Union is going to borrow to fund the recovery fund is going to be borrowed by effectively euro bonds. The EU Commission bonds are euro bonds because they are on behalf of everyone. So they are homogeneous, they are not fragmented. And that, somebody can say to me, come on, you've been calling for this since 2002, the first time I wrote an article in favor of euro bonds with South Africa. Now, you know, shut up, Yanis, and just celebrate that this has happened at long last. And this is a major, they even call it a Hamiltonian moment because of Alexander Hamilton's point um, that the only way the colonies of the, that constructed, constructed, comprised the uh, United States of America, the only way that they could become a nation was through having a common debt. Now, that, that is true. That is, you know, I acknowledge that, that that's a major shift, major shift. However, the reason why I'm, uh, um, you know, not celebrating um, the the fund, I'm celebrating the common bonds. If you want us to celebrate something, let's you know celebrate together the common bonds because these are these are essential. However, the reason why I'm saying that it's not only not in the uh, uh, you know enough uh, because let's let, let's get this elephant out of the room as well. The total amount is is ludicrously small. If you look at the, the grants, not the loans, we don't care about the loans. The, you know, the loans are not part of a fiscal transfer. But if you look at the grants, we're talking about officially 390, my estimation is 310 billion, it's 0.6% of GDP across uh, the Eurozone um, over three years. It, you know, when the, only the output gap, as estimated by the European Commission, um, is 8%. So 8% is, you know, the gap, 0.6% is what um, uh, uh, this recovery fund provides. Um, but even if this was not 0.6%, it was 6%. Of course, it would be better. But not necessarily politically, from a, as I, allow me to say this as a Europeanist, it would be even more toxic politically. I mean, look, look at the Italian government collapse. Why did it collapse? Because Renzi, 
okay, uh, didn't trust Conte with the recovery fund money. Okay, now Draghi comes in, okay, right. But we are still going to have a situation where national governments are being called upon to distribute the money. Now, Kevin, you know Greece, I know Greece. Okay, this is not a criticism necessarily of the current party in government, but I know very well what's going to happen. I know who's going to get the money. And I can tell you, it's not going to be small businesses. It is not going to be the startups of young people that we need to retain in Greece to stop the brain drain. It will be the same old oligarchs that um, caused the, uh, the bankruptcy in the first place. It will be Fraport. Fraport got our, you know, you, everybody knows who Fraport is. They got 14 Greek airports for no money at all, right? All with loans from the Greek banks that were recapitalized by the Greek state, which took the money from um, taxpayers from Slovakia, Slovenia, Germany, right? <laughs> so the little people effectively paid for Fraport to get the airports. They have a monopoly of, at Santorini Airport, which once COVID-19 is out, is like, you know, the, the goose that lays the, the golden egg. And they are going to get grants from the recovery fund. So again, poor Germans are going to be paying for the Greek oligarchs or companies operating in Greece. Now, that is okay. not an auspicious sign regarding political union. Very soon, you're going to have the FDP in Germany, no, not to mention the alternative for Deutschland, right? But the Free Democrats. You're going to have elements within the CDU. The next chancellor in Germany is going to say, hang on a second, where is this money going? Mm. The idea that this is going to be a first Hamiltonian step for me is pie in the sky. Okay, so going in the right direction would remove this sense of um, national misallocations because there would be the automaticity that you've uh, mentioned at the European uh, level. But of course, um, the conditions for that automaticity would be, I presume, uh, a much more democratic uh, European uh, system. Now, uh, like others, I was reading um, a very interesting article you published a couple of weeks ago in the New Statesman in which you mentioned that the European Union, as currently constituted, is, quote, immune to democracy. So uh, from what you say, it sounds to me as if the European Union is in some kind of bind, uh, that there is no obvious way out. The solution is to have automatic uh, payments. The prerequisite are the social and political conditions to have a system accepting automaticity of payments. But how on earth, in your logic, would the European Union get there? Well, that's an excellent question. That's the pertinent question. Uh, especially in the climate of mistrust between North, South, East, West, you know, the whole thing. You're absolutely right. I'm not saying there are easy answers to this, but my answer would be this. We need to, to move. We, it's impossible to move to a federation now because, you know, any political party that suggests federation, right, is going to be drabbed in elections any, everywhere, right? Because uh, the, the whole idea of Europeanism has been sullied by the last 10 years. Mm. So you get, we, to, in, in order to get to the automaticity of a federation, we need to have a transition period, a transition scheme, which incorporates automaticity in a way that everyone can accept not everyone, but there can be a critical mass of political forces behind it, to take us towards federation, to make a conversation about a democratic federation possible, because now it's not even possible. So I think we agree on that. Uh, okay, so here's uh, what, you know, back in March, I was racking my, br my, my brains in order to try to provide an answer to your question, because I had that question myself. How do you know if I were in the, in the European Union Council, not that I, that I was anywhere near it, but yeah, you know, that is what we academics do, um, imaginative people do. We try to imagine what would I say? Because the only way of being re critical without being stupid is to have an alternative to what is being discussed in the corridors of power. So, here's what, what, what I, I would have done, what I would have suggested. 
if I was in the Eurogroup, if I was in the European Union Council. Okay, guys, we know that we're going to be hit with um, a recession due to the simultaneous hits on demand and supply across Europe, especially in the service sector. We know that. Lockdowns, that's what they do. Uh, we know that um, unless our states take on more debt, public debt, then the private debt is going to, to explode. And we're going to have a lot more bankruptcy. So we know that. We know that's going to be already, we, we can imagine, we can envisage significant increases in public debt everywhere, from Germany all the way to Greece, right? Uh, okay. Already, some countries are more debt stricken, more indebted than others. Uh, so let's freeze time. Let's say, imagine that we can consider the debt level that we already have to be you know, the responsibility for member states. But all additions, all additions um, are Europeanized. And how do you Europeanize additional debt? Well, technically, it's not difficult. And here's what I proposed back in March. Imagine, you see, the problem with Macron's uh, proposal about Euro, Euro bonds is that it is, um, it, 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 it's unconvincing, you know. Wolfgang Schäuble, since you mentioned him before, in, before we, go, we went on air, Wolfgang Schäuble would say, hang on a second, who's going to issue them? Who's going to issue them? You know, you don't have a federal treasury uh, like you have in the United States to issue treasury bills. So who, who the hell is going to issue uh, the, the, uh, the, the euro bonds? Uh, well, now that the European Union is issuing them with a recovery fund, uh, we know that all our member states are backing those bonds, uh, but, that, but we also know that this is really not particularly sincere, since you know Greece cannot back any bonds. I mean, you know, Greece is completely bankrupt. You know, we have 370 billion uh, euros worth of gross debt, and we have 160 billion GDP. It's you know, it's, we're already bankrupt. So German voters have every reason to fear that this is going to fall upon them, right? Mm. Uh, so my proposal was this, not the European Commission, the European Central Bank should issue the bonds. And people say, what do you mean? A bank issuing bonds? Yes, why not? All banks issue bonds. Somebody say, but hang on, no central bank has ever issued bonds. That's not true. The Central Bank of Chile issues bonds every year. So technically it can be done. So imagine if the ECB was given the task by the European Union Council, and I'm sure that Christine Lagarde would like it, she wouldn't mind it at all, because it would lessen the pressure on her to do everything using her printing presses. Okay, because we're not asking her to print money, we're asking her to print bonds on behalf of Europe. Okay, and sell it to the Chinese, to Germans, to rich Greeks, whoever, you could buy them, right? Um, and who wouldn't buy a bond issued by a central bank, the Central Bank of Europe? It would be, you know, quadruple A rated. Uh, and that should be a 30 year bond. I mean, I chose 30 years, Kevin, on purpose. Because 30 years means it does not need to be paid for 30 years. So it gives us a deadline, a 30 year deadline to get our house in order in Europe and create the federal treasury and the, and the federation that is necessary. Mm -hmm. Now, if we cannot do it in 30 years, we, have, we should burn in hell. You know, I mean, we should do it in 30 years. I'm not saying three years, I'm not saying 30 years. We created the monetary union in 1991, 1992. The euro started rolling off the presses in 2000. Okay, um, we, 30 years is enough. That way, you know, we don't have to answer the question who will repay this bond. We are giving ourselves a, a, a deadline. Deadline effects, we all know, work very well. Think of deadline effects at university, you know, when it comes to assignments. Yeah, 30 years, we can do it. And if needs be, you know, at some point the CB can print some money to repay them. Uh, but you know, there's no need for that if we, we have 30 years to do it. So okay. you create a degree of automaticity for the additional debt. So you don't have to answer the question, okay, so, so what are we going to do with Italy? Italy is, you know, buckling under the weight of all this new debt. Okay. This is Europeanized. Okay, that's... Uh, that's and then the investment funding... The investment funding, Kevin, not through Rome or Athens. I do not want to see the Greek government or the Italian government 
receiving monies from the German, the Slovakian taxpayers, from the Italian taxpayers to, you know, featherbed, sorry, I'm not playing with your, I'm toying with your uh, surname here, to featherbed the nests of their mates. Yeah. I would like to see, for instance, let me give you an example, a pan-European um, renewables, green energy union, which we yeah. need. Okay. So imagine the European Investment Bank, which already has been doing this now for decades, running a huge investment program that would be gigantic and it will go straight into good quality jobs, batteries and stuff, artificial intelligence that Europe needs anyway, and we're falling behind the Chinese and the Americans. Okay. So that way you take the national governments out. Excellent, thank you, that's very clear. Um, I think just um, a couple of more questions from me, but very briefly, if I may, because I want then to go to the student questions, which I can see on my screen uh, here. Uh, you'll recall, of course, that after uh, Syriza came to power in January 2015, the then Vice President of the European Commission famously said, we don't change policies because of elections. That, so was, that was Schäuble who said that. I, I think but I think they were in, in synchronization. Come on, Dobro, Dobrovsky simply copies whatever Schäuble says. Okay. Schäuble, don't, don't, you know, don't, don't allow him to plagiarize. That was Schäuble. Okay. Um, elections so, should not be allowed to change economic policy in the Eurozone. That was very bad thing what Schäuble said. Okay, thanks. So your answer, uh, looking to the future, is that uh, he was wrong because politicians at the European level should make the decision rather than relying on those in Athens or Rome or elsewhere. Just very briefly, is that your argument? Look, when Schäuble said what he said in the Eurogroup, right, I could see he had a point. Not that I agree with him, but he had a point. The way we have structured the architecture of the Eurozone is a complete catastrophe, right? Uh, if indeed you have elections all the time, and you, you have 19 finance ministers sitting around, the you know, next time it will be somebody else. So if that somebody else said, ah, we need to go back, back to the drawing board, it is a cal calamity. There's no doubt about it. So Schäuble was right. But to say what he said, which is, just because this is what we have agreed, this is what we must agree, and we must not discuss anything and anything else. Yeah, that's another matter. <laughs> that's another matter. Okay, now let me uh, go to the questions which are coming in and I can see that there are many of them. Unfortunately, many of the questions are um, academic articles in themselves, so uh, bear with me. <laughs> um, they are LSE students. Uh, Mr Varoufakis, do you think Greece should take the opportunity to increase its leverage by working more with Russia and China to take more advantage of its crucial location and increasing role as a trading center in the Mediterranean. That's from Daniel McIntyre. Um, well, Daniel, um, I was asked that question when I was in the finance ministry by my prime minister at the time, and I said no. <laughs> uh, not that I didn't want to do business with China, because China is a very important economy, and I tried to expand an agreement with the Chinese regarding uh, the port of Piraeus, I wanted to change the terms of the contract, but I also wanted to include many other joint ventures with the Chinese. But that is not the issue. That is not, it's not a substitute to having a European policy. When you've got, when your country is part of a monetary union and part of the European Union single market, that's where you need to concentrate uh, all your efforts in reforming yourself and the European Union in which you are part of. Everything else is an add-on. Everything else is a luxury. Everything else is uh, additional. But it's not, you know, we, uh, it, let's face it, we are a country that we are not controlling our own currency. Um, so if you want, I mean, there were interesting calls for us to get out of the Euro, to get out of the Euro Union, the European Union, you know, Grexit and so on. I said interesting, not that I agreed with. Uh, but that's another matter. And, uh, you know, who tells you that the Chinese really wanted uh, Greece to become part of the Remnimbi zone or uh, to, to become part of its sphere of influence. No, no, we Europeans, we need to get our house in order in Europe. So, because you see, this is not, the, the, the thing I love about today's meeting, having the German society, the Greek society, is that, that it gives me an opportunity, you know, to climb on the rooftop and shout uh, with all my strength. This is not a question of the Greeks versus the Germans. 
or the north versus the south. This is a question of an architecture which was not fit for purpose neither for the Greeks nor for the Germans. And you have an oligarchic um, south. You know, people say to me, should you, you know, the other question that I'm constantly asked is, except yours, Daniel, you know, the other compared to yours, is shouldn't the, the south of Europe, um, you know, uh, secede from the European Union and create its own union? No! Absolutely no. You know, um, there's nothing no, uh, worse than the Greek oligarchs and the Italian oligarchs. I prefer the German oligarchs. They are nicer people than the Greek oligarchs. So it's not a question of the South getting together. We need to move away from a situation where, because if you think about it, before 2008, the Greek oligarchs, together with the German bankers and the French bankers, were running riot. They were violating every rule, ethical rule, rule macroeconomic rule, everything, you know, we're creating a huge bubble and we're pushing the whole of Europe into a corner. And then when that bubble bursts, the same oligarchs, the, the Northern European and the Southern Europeans gang gang together against, you know, the German middle class and lower class and the Greek, of course, and the Italian lower class and middle class and say, ah, it's all your fault. So, okay. you know, let's move on beyond that. <laughs> okay, thanks. There's a question here for, uh, from an LSE law uh, student. It is uh, from Neri Binismagi, I assume, of the Lorenzo Binismagi uh, yeah. family, uh, joining us from Milan. The automated theory seems a bit inadequate, especially if we compare the European Union to other states, such as the UK. It is like comparing apples and pears. The European Union is a supranational state, and many things are needed to build the federation. The recovery fund has shown for the first time in the European Union's history that it is possible to create a common debt that only nine years ago was a mirage in the economic crisis. If the recovery fund is not a first step towards federation, what would be more effective? Well, I've already answered that question, I think, in answering your question, Kevin, uh, when I talked about the European Central Bank bond and so on. But allow me to say to... Uh, Terry. Terry. Terry, 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 uh, Terry, look, if that had happened, the recovery fund, if the recovery fund had happened in 2010, I would agree with you, but we've wasted 10 years, the politics has been poisoned, uh, the ultra-right and the Eurosceptics um, are, um, you know, anteportas, and this was a magnificent opportunity, not only to have the common debt, the common debt is important, but to tie together with the automatic stabilizers, because you may say that this is a supranational construct, the, the European Union, of course it is. But the, the fact remains that this supernatural co uh, uh, construct saw it fit to create a common currency a long time ago, to have a 10 year crisis that was left unattended effectively, and now, the common debt, which is absolutely necessary, a necessary condition, I agree with you there, right? Not only is not sufficient, but when you couple it with the intergovernmental way of distributing the money, it toxifies the politics further. And it makes, let me put it this way, the next Dutch government, I don't know who it's going to be, the next Finnish government, and I'm sure the next German government, is going to be far less open to the idea of fiscal transfers as a result of this recovery fund, not more open to it, whatever Draghi does in Italy. Well, thanks. Uh, Philip Nelson, who is a member of the British German Association, uh, says the necessary condition for a move towards federalism would seem to be greater democratic engagement, leading to better democratic control. Is this more achievable through institutional arrangements or is a change in the attitudes of people and electorates more important? And I guess uh, perhaps if I could just add to that, um, perhaps you might wish to comment on the extent to which we could have a, a common European campaign which would shift people's attitudes in these respects beyond institutional uh, tinkering and obviously you've had much uh, experience on that perhaps you want to talk to that well my answer to your question is not either or we need both we need to change the atmosphere the climate amongst european citizens at the moment i mentioned that before 
if you go to any European, I know, and with very few exceptions, you know, very few exceptions, maybe in this room, <laughs> but outside, you know, in the real world, if you, if, you know, if I talk to people, when I mention federation, they say, no, 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 no. Even people who were federalists up until, you know, a few years ago or months ago. Um, so we need to change the climate to make it possible for people to start imagining a federal Europe again. So it's not either or. To have the institutional changes towards federation, we need to change the climate and the mood amongst the people. To change the mood among the, amongst the people, we need a, a medium-term plan. Okay, I tried to give an example of one where you've got these, you know, the ECB bonds, uh, making sure that the extra COVID-19 induced public debt does not fall onto the shoulders of the weakest of states. Uh, okay, without excusing, without writing off any of the existing debt, so as not to annoy, um, you know. The northerners, the you know the frugal fours or fives or sixes, whatever you know what I mean, right? Um, by making those moves that detoxify the politics and create a semblance, you know, effectively a simulation of federation. This is what I I have been working towards. Imagining how we can, without having federation, simulate the federation. This is what the ECB bond uh, does. It simulates a common bond. Right? in order to, to, to change the atmosphere. For people to see that Europe is a source of solutions for them, not a source of austerity or of penalties. And okay. sim simultaneously to have, this is what you know, we, uh, some of us have been working since 2015, 2016 towards, we created a movement called the Democracy in Europe movement. This is what I work on every day, DiEM25. It's a transnational European movement. We have members from all countries. It's not a federation. It's a unitary movement. We are all there as Europeans. We don't have a Greek chapter and a German chapter. Germans and Greeks and Portuguese. This is what we're trying to show how it's done, how transnational politics, federal politics can be done without even a federal political movement. Uh, I, I, I believe very strongly in demonstrating in practice how we can move towards a constitutional assembly at some point, whereas Europeans, we, de we decide to put together, to author jointly uh, a democratic constitution for the European Union. Okay, thank you. I'm going to try to squeeze in two more uh, questions, if I may. There's sure. a, question a question here from uh, Michalis Saris from Cyprus. Uh, and it's just uh, gone off my screen. Uh, bear with me. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a good question. Come on, Michali, we will find your question. <laughs> Uh, basically, it was saying the European Central Bank is already buying national debt. Yes, the European Central Bank is in parallel buying a lot of national debt. Is that not similar to your proposal already? No, 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 no. Not in the slightest, because even though they buy, you know, hundreds of billions of Italian debt and tens of billions of Greek new debt, uh, that remains Greek debt and Italian debt. So the Italian debt to GDP ratio continues to grow. It doesn't matter who owns it, whether it is the European Central Bank or Kevin. <laughs> it doesn't matter. It, it, okay, I mean, it's good that they are buying it because they're keeping the, the interest rates low. But the total debt overhang uh, continues to grow and COVID-19 effectively makes, makes Italy even more dependent on the ECB. And let me ask you this question. I mean, you know about the, the uh, fairly recent decision of the Constitutional Court in Germany that the ECB must unwind that position. Now, when the next chancellor is installed in Berlin, and we don't know who this is going to be, but whoever is going to be is going to be more traditional than Angela Merkel. There is no doubt about that, at least in my mind. The pressure on that person who is going to be far less powerful uh, than Angela Merkel is going to be huge from the Buddhist Bank and from others to give, to send the message to the ECB, start selling Italian debt. You've accumulated too much. And then what happens? Okay, thank you. William O'Connell, who is uh, a student in international political economy. Uh, Mr. Varifakis, uh, could a central bank digital currency help internationalize the euro? And what implications could a digital currency by the central bank have for monetary policy, f financial stability, the payment system, and future recovery funds within the currency 
block. Brilliant question. Thank you. Look, uh, all currencies are digital, more or less, in the sense that you know most of the payments we make are digital, right? But when we talk about a central bank digital currency, it's important to know what we're talking about. We're talking about cutting the middleman out. Mm. When Christine Lagarde's ECB, or you know uh, the Fed in the United States, or the Bank of England, when they print money, when they do QE, what they do is that they immediately lend to the commercial banks. So the ECB lends to Santander, lends to Societe Generale, lends to Deutsche Bank, hoping that they would lend it on to Volkswagen and so on, and they will create jobs and so on. They don't create jobs, they take this money, take it to the stock exchange and buy back their own shares. Uh, and the result is, you know, stock exchanges that do wonderfully well, but the investment is not happening, right? <laughs> um, a digital currency would, uh, would work as follows. Imagine if, just to make it simple, that the ECB tomorrow were to create a bank account for each one of us in the Eurozone. They could. It's really very simple. And give you a PIN number so you can transfer money and even a credit card, a plastic card or whatever, or an app on the phone. You don't even need the plastic anymore, right? And suddenly, uh, the middleman is, is cut out. There is no Deutsche Bank or National Bank of Greece between the ECB and you. That kind of digital currency, which is what the Chinese are planning, what the Chinese central bank is planning, would be a majestic tool in internationalizing the euro. But it would have to come together with a common bond. Because remember, the United States dollar retains its exorbitant privilege because of the huge quantity of common American bonds. Let, let me explain this for those who don't understand it. When a Chinese industrialist you know, sells stuff to the United States and gets dollars and needs to store them somewhere, what he does, usually he, sometimes she, uh, they, they buy US Treasury bills. So they keep it in dollar denominated, but with Europe, you can't do that. Europe has a, ma a very large current account surplus, but if you're Chinese, then you have to buy German boons, but there aren't enough. And then do you buy Greek ones? Or Italian ones? No, not unless you're a gambler. So this is why the euro will never be properly internationalized until we have a large common bond and it, it would really help to have uh, the digital currency. Thank you. A uh, question from Konstantinos. Creating a common debt leaves wide open the possibility for a limited number of corporations to benefit while EU citizens would be called to replay, repay this debt. What kind of mechanisms could effectively avoid such a scenario? Well, thank you, because this is exactly what I'm saying. The reason why I fear the, this common debt, I want common debt, but the way it's going to be distributed, it's going to be, you know, poor Germans paying for the rich Greeks. And this is really not good either for the Greeks or the Germans or for the European Union. Uh, what could we have done instead? Look, it's what I said before to Kevin, uh, Constantine cut out the national governments, you know, have a European investment program that creates a green energy union, because this is, you know, the, 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 game, the name of the game is green energy for the next 10 years, especially with climate change amelioration and all that, we need green energy. You know, we still have, you know, Germany is building lignite um, power stations, my, my, for, good, for goodness sake, you, know, you only need to state that to realize the failure of the European Union when it comes to, to energy policy. Why? Because we're not investing it. We're not investing in battery production and the Chinese are running away with it. Okay, so I would like to see a European investment program which is run by, let's create a new agency for green works. Like, you know, the Americans created the Organization of Economic, uh, European Economic Cooperation to, you know, to, to distribute the monies of, of the Marshall Aid Plan. I want to cut out the private banks and I want to cut out the national governments. Thanks. Um, a couple of weeks ago, Yanni, there was an interview in the Financial Times with uh, Wolfgang Schäuble. And he was saying something that sounds somewhat similar in that he was saying that uh, one, we can't really rely on the funds from the recovery fund being wisely spent across different national uh, settings but also that uh, at the European level, we should set certain priorities. 
uh, one of which was building the digital uh, economy. And so I understood his logic to be somewhat similar to yours, is that the EU level, we should choose fund A, B, C, setting priorities and invest in that, uh, in that fashion. So um, are you now converging with your friend Wolfgang Schäuble? Well, interestingly enough, the paths have been converging and diverging for many, many years. Because if you think about it, Wolfgang Schäuble made his name in the 1990s as a federalist. Mm. Remember that? The mm. articles in the Financial Times uh, mm. and so on calling for a federation, a fiscal union. Uh, I think that you will allow me to say that, with all due respect to Wolfgang, that uh, his tragedy was that he was never a chancellor. And he, you know, he had to, to use the finance ministry um, in order to try to steer Europe in a way that he couldn't using the finance, the finance industry, uh, the, finance, uh, the, the finance ministry. If he were a chancellor, he would be a very different uh, beast. Beast, I'm not saying this in a nasty way, I'm saying it in a nice way. And I'm just coming back to this. In our conversations, we agreed a lot more than people think that we, that we agreed. We agreed that the current organization of the, Euro, the Eurozone was not fit for purpose. We agreed that there was a need for a federal budget, for federation. So none of, none of that surprises me. Uh, it was his insistence, however, on perpetual covering up of the bankruptcy of states like Greece in order to save banks like Deutsche Bank. That is what I do not forgive, not to Volkan Schäuble, but to the government in Germany for all this time, because in the name of solidarity with Greece, they were giving huge quantities of money to the Greek state, to the corrupt Greek state, in order to pay off the, you know, the, the, the totally dismal and failed French and German banks uh, at the price of huge austerity for the Greeks, but also for German workers, because the same austerity was practiced, uh, was imposed upon um, you know, at least 50% of the German population. The, you know, the, the IFD and anti-Europeanism and even the turn against Merkel at some point um, is, is the result of that. Okay, thank you. I see that we're out of time. Uh, for all of those who sent, you, sent me questions, uh, forgive me for not uh, being able to go through uh, all of them. But I'd certainly like to thank uh, our guest, Yanis Varoufakis, for uh, answering so many questions. And if I may say, in a very clear, accessible uh, fashion, who thought that economics could be quite so clear? Uh, thank you, thank for, uh, you for that. Can I also uh, thank the LSE Students' Union um, German Society and the Hellenic Society? Like Yanis, I think it's great that the two societies are collaborating in this kind of uh, discussion. Whether we think the European Recovery and Resilience Fund uh, is a step too far or too little or in the wrong direction, we probably can all agree that there is some kind of crossroads uh, this year and decisions to be made. And I think today we've had a very eloquent uh, critique of uh, the fund as going in the wrong direction and needing uh, additional uh, measures to be taken. I can see from the questions that you've sent in across the politics, the um, antecedents for uh, creating a new political system, uh, that uh, you share many of the issues that have been raised uh, today. The discussion will obviously uh, continue, but I think we've had a very eloquent um, contribution to the debate to help us uh, better understand the issues. So on behalf of everyone and myself, thank you for joining us. And again, thank you, Yanni, and uh, goodbye. Thank you, Kevin. Thank All you. the best. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone.